The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. You've always got time for short time. Hey, it's Warren Lopez. David Taylor. Fred Metcalf. Johnny Hendricks. Tony Ramos. Bubba J. Mike Gold. Matthew Modine. The one and only Chael Sonnen. And you are listening to the one and only Short Time Wrestling Podcast by the often imitated and never duplicated Jason Bryant. On location with a Short Time Wrestling Podcast in Novosad, Serbia. As we've just finished up session one of day two at the European Championships, Jason Bryan here with you with uh, the Silent H man himself, Andy Rovat, coaching David Habit with Slovenia. And we've had Dave on the show before talk about his experience before the World Championships in 2015. Andy, you're here. You don't even have clothes. Thankfully, you're wearing them now. But coaching with David Habit in Serbia, I mean, this is just w- weird things that wrestling brings. Yeah, I, I came straight from the U.S. Open. Uh, I had a carry-on bag that they forced me to check, and uh, they only checked it to my layover. So I'm, I'm stuck with the same outfit I've had on for three days. And uh, lucky they gave me this cool little T-shirt uh, when I checked in, so I have a second T-shirt. But uh, but yeah, it's been a whirlwind of a few days, and it's it's uh, I'm excited that you know Dave's doing well here. Yeah, you've traveled the world. Have you been to Serbia before? Uh, yes, we had the European Olympic qualifier not too far from here last year. Okay, that's right. It's Drenadine, I believe it is. Yeah, Drenadine or Drenadine, yeah, whatever. Sounds like drama, mean. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so when we look at, we found out, this, so by the time this comes out, Dave will, people listening will know that Dave has either won or not won the bronze medal match. He opened up his competition today with a loss to Boris Novotkov, who American wrestling fans know wrestled at Cal Poly. Uh, his head's been had a, a tremendous development in freestyle. Dave's development is also uh, extremely noticeable. And, and what's it mean for you to sit there and be like, you know, that David Habit's wrestling for Slovenia's first medal ever in European Championship history? Uh, it, you know, it's very exciting. You know, when we first uh, started talking, when Dave was still at Annabro, uh he was looking for places to go, and, you know, he wanted to come to Michigan because I was a full-time coach, uh, and there's not too many RTCs with a full-time coach. And, uh, you know, he started talking to me about wrestling for Slovenia. Uh, you know, both his parents and my parents grew up in a Slovenia neighborhood in uh, Cleveland. Um, you know, not too many people know, but my last name is the fourth most common in Slovenia, Rovat. And uh, so like here, Smith, Johnson, Williams, Rovat. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, so so we started talking to the, the Federation and, you know, they, they didn't really know what to expect with Dave. They didn't know what to expect with myself. Um, you know, they have one of the best officials uh, in wrestling right now, uh, Stanislav Cernik. Uh, and, and so he was our point guy in Slovenia. And, you know, he was kind of like, yeah, we'll see how it goes at the World Championships in Vegas. And, uh, you know, Dave wrestled really well. Uh, unfortunately, lost to uh, Mohamed or the the Iranian yeah. and uh you know, then, then uh, you know, last year w- w- was a breakthrough year for him, and, and he wrestled very well, puts up a lot of points, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's exciting that he gets to wrestle for their first ever medal. And how is it like when you're from from your experiences, what you've learned about being an outsider and trying to use the citizenship and, and be able to represent another country? What's that process been like for you as a coach and for Dave as an athlete? Well, I mean, you know, it. it to me, it doesn't matter where you wrestle or who you wrestle for. Um, you know, wrestling is always going to be an individual sport. It's you against one other person. So you're always wrestling for yourself, number one. Um, but, uh, you know, just when I lived and trained in Russia, you know, these, these people are, you know, Russians will wrestle for all these other countries. And I mean, it's, it's a hodgepodge of nationalities in that southern Caucasus region. But they, they treated me like I was family. They treat each other like they're family. Um, you know, we're one big wrestling family and and so who you represent doesn't really matter it's just you know how you represent yourself and you know being able to come here you know I get to see so many you know close friends of mine you know from from all my travels and experiences and um, you know they welcome me here with open arms even though I'm you know also with you know the American delegation so um, you know like I said it doesn't really matter you know who you are where you're from but you know just how you represent yourself. What I found interesting is I even threw this, threw this out on Twitter is that the only time I've heard English from the corner was when I looked up and I hear English. I go, Habit must be wrestling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the uh, the the uh, England delegation isn't too strong here. So, so yeah, I'm the I'm pretty much the only English speaking uh, corner man in the Europeans. 
Uh, Maxime speaks English, you know, and, and Maxime Molnoff, we mentioned him on the broadcast. He coached with Coach Steiner last year. He was in the corner for Ville Haino yesterday and then uh, Gregory Aver from uh, Lafayette today. But what's one thing that coaching Dave is really kind of, I mean, you've, you've traveled the world as an athlete, but what's what's the, the world traveling like as a coach? How many, how many more opportunities or, or how many situations does that open your eyes to? Well, one, it's a lot more stressful. Last year when we had the Olympic qualifying, it was five weeks of travel and you know we went from serbia to slovenia to turkey to to mongolia to korea back to turkey and you know it's a lot of and and you know i took for granted as an athlete with usa wrestling um and they do such a great job behind the scenes with cody and jamie um with you know making sure all the logistics are there and set for you but that that's put on me here so so that's opened my eyes but uh but you know, just I mean, I've like I said, you've you like you said, but I mean, I've been coaching for a long time, and 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 the opportunities are always there. Um, but it's it's just I'm able to you know help them just a little bit with the mental side of it, you know, just because it's very difficult. But you know, having done it myself and very recently, um, you know, I, I know what they're going through, and you know, I could be not lenient, but like understanding of you know their problems and troubles and you know just you know make sure that they have the best situation you've been outspoken over the course of your career as an athlete and now a coach about certain you know even even with usa wrestling and united world wrestling what are some things that you've seen that have been uh rectified or corrected and some things that you think united world wrestling is doing well at uh, this type of championships or what are some things you still think they need to work on well i'm well i'm super excited yeah i've been vocal um but only for only because you know i care um, you know, it's no, no, nothing personal against anybody or any organization. Um, and, and I like to think that uh, sometimes they listen to me. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm super excited for, for some of the future world changes. Uh, I know coming from the U.S. Open, uh, the U.S. officials didn't get the calls right. Uh, you know, not too many caution twos here for touching the hands. No, nobody's slapping hands for finger fighting. Um, the, the, the spirit of the rule is, yeah, if you're grabbing hands to, to, to slow action, yeah. I could understand that's caution too, but the way they call it in, at the U.S. Open, definitely not the spirit of the rule. Um, but uh, UWW is doing such a tremendous job. You know, they have a great product for for online viewership, which is exactly what tournaments are for. Um, you know, it's hard in some of these areas to get huge attendance, but there's a lot of people online watching, and and um, you know, I think they've done a great job. Um, you know, I was talking to, to Tim Foley on the way here. We shared a, a bus. Um, and, uh, you know, even though we, we go back and forth on Twitter, uh, you know, him and I are friends and, you know, we, we like to talk about a lot of this stuff. But, um, you know, I told him I was really impressed uh, when they dropped wrestling from the Olympics. I was in that first meeting with with Save Olympic Wrestling and, you know, it was a bunch of powerful people and, and, and myself. You guys don't understand, like the Olympic Committee, whatever you guys want to say, the Olympic Committee wants to see that wrestling has a fan base. And the only way you're going to see a fan base is social media. And because in also online viewership with with the live streaming but i told tim yesterday i was super impressed that stan desic told me i was crazy and that that it didn't matter even though the vote came down to how many social media followers uww had because they were voting to save the sport and wrestling won those votes um but on top of that they would live uh feeding the weigh-ins yesterday on Facebook and I was that was the one thing I was super impressed with and I'm glad you asked me that question it took a while to get to that point but um but yeah live feed for weigh-ins that was, that was so cool yeah, because that's one thing. Typically in the states, you're like, you know, it's like you know, you hear a term. Are we going to open the doors for weigh-ins? No, because you know, in, in college, you're basically in, you have to weigh. You don't weigh in with a singlet. Here, you weigh in with a singlet. So it's like, do you want fans watching? You know, three hundred well-trimmed wrestlers weighing in in their skivvies. No, here you've got it. There's really it, it kind of showed the transparency because the weigh-in process, or the the, the weigh-in process, and the and the draw process has actually been fairly transparent over the years. Just nobody knew that. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, I mean, it, it's really, it, it was just neat to see. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. Now, when we look at the situation here, people assume that uh, well, we're at the Europeans. They, they should be packing the people in. And now there's been, you know, the crowd has been good for the finals last night, kind of sparse during the day. But this is 
primarily a Greco region. So the last two days, we're expecting to see big crowds. What have you seen in your travels about the differences between fan bases in these countries with Greco and freestyle? Oh, yeah, for, for sure. Um, you know, there's certain countries that, that have their styles. And, you know, last year at the European qualifier, Greco finals were crazy. Uh, fans were getting into it. Um, you know, there's certain areas where you go to Japan, they're going to have so many more fans for the women, which, you know, American fans don't, wouldn't understand that. Um, China, they'd probably have more fans for the women. Um, even some, some of the Swedish country, uh, North, the Nordic countries, Scandinavian, Nordic, whatever you want to call them. Um, but yeah, down here in, in some of these Eastern European and Baltic countries, it, it's Greco rules. And, um, you know, I saw it at Hungary for the world championships. It'll happen again next year in Hungary. Um, probably even this year in France, they got a pretty good Greco team. Uh, so it's just neat to see like, you know, because we take it for granted in the U.S., you know, we're, we're freestyle is king because of folk style. Um, you know, it's cool to watch um, people get excited for the other styles while we travel. Going back to the discussion about the officiating and the rules, I haven't seen too many situations where a correct throw has caused any controversy here in the first day and a half of competition. I think I saw a situation where uh, in a women's match there was a good head throw, an outside trip, and it landed, and two went up. And I, without thinking, I assume that was just two for the throw, but theoretically I should have been four because she, you know, she landed, but she didn't land in danger. So there's the two. That one just blew right by me. When you're seeing correct throw, it hasn't really shown up a whole lot here. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's going to show up a lot here. Um, I don't think it showed showed up a lot in in uh, the U.S. Open, other than that one controversial match. But you know, really, you know, when I was talking to Tim yesterday, the spirit of that rule is, you know, they want to make sure that the officials aren't too confused going from freestyle to Greco, freestyle to Greco, because you want you want a similar rule set. Um, you know, so the correct throw, they, you know, they put it in freestyle, but you know, Greco, there's not many holds you can have. You could have over under position. You could have a two on one. And you could have an overhook slash underhook on one side, um, you know. So you're very limited in the amount of throws you can have, which so it makes sense if you go for the throw you don't get it, they could give you a point. But you know, in freestyle, when you start giving correct throws for a desperation hold when a guy's got your leg, that may not be the spirit of the rule. It was a correct call, yeah, but um, you know, wrestling doesn't need that, especially leg attacks. Um, you know, I could see it. They amend the rule and say only upper body throws um you know maybe that would help but you know who knows you know it's it's rare we don't see a whole lot of it in freestyle but the five has been brought back we did see one last night and it was basically a single leg taking somebody up over top and boom uh what do you think about having the five back in freestyle i mean i i think it's fine do they still have the four yeah they still have four it's kind of weird to me but um you know i guess you get an extra point for for a pretty cool throw i mean to me, you know, to me, the points don't matter. Um, you know, one of the best rule changes I ever had was changing a takedown to two um, j- just because it, it, it opens up the match more. So, you know, if you lose, if you know, if you get one takedown, it's one zero. But, uh, you know, it's a lot different when it's two zero on the board, especially with push out being one. But, um, you know, I think UWW has, has the points and the rules right, you know, for the first time in a long time. And, um, you know, here the officials aren't stepping in and taking control of the match. I saw one call, uh, Baltikayev's first match, caution two. I don't really agree with that call. Um, but other than that, I, I mean, the guy was backing a little bit, uh, but he was circling at the same time. So, it, I mean, it's questionable, but not nothing terrible. Um, but, but the U.S. officials, again, last week, were, they were just trying to step in the match too much, and they just too much chatter, just shut the mouth and let the athletes figure it out. It's one of these things, and usually when there's a call, like we're, you know, we're referencing the Oliver Rutherford call with the correct throw, but when, and people, that will sour their taste on freestyle. What's something that you can say is, you know, you, you wrestle folk style going up, then you wrestle freestyle, you make an Olympic team, you're, you're coaching both, you're coaching kids to do that stuff with, with the base wrestling and all that. What is something that you think the American fan base misses out the most, the point they miss the most when it comes to international styles of wrestling? Uh, I, I think the, the athleticism it takes to, to be world class, um, when you have to protect your back, um, you know, because no matter what style of sp- wrestling you're competing in, whether it's American folk style, um, foreign folk styles, you know, most people don't realize that foreign 
countries have folk styles all over, and almost all of them are, resemble Greco because they don't had they didn't have mats, you know. So it was mostly all upper body stuff. Um, but when you had to protect your back, you had to be that much more athletic not to be able to roll. And that that's over the last few years, and you know, the, and, and they're trying to start to address this in American folk style. But um, when you could just defend and go across your back, you know, that to me as a fan, that that is that is like the worst thing because like the point of wrestling is to put somebody on their back and and so um you know i think that's what a lot of people miss is is the discipline you have to have and the athleticism you have to have and even strength too i mean especially at this level i mean so it takes a lot of core strength to stay off your back yeah, let's talk about that and that the natural core strength that kind of segues into what you you guys have been doing, uh, you and Jake Herbert and the, and the crew up there with, with base wrestling and then uh, Barr was training and all that stuff. And how, how have those things factored in and made you a better coach and looking at how to help train David Habit for freestyle? Uh, you know, when I came back from Russia, I had their training, but I didn't have anything. Like, I didn't, they didn't give me any papers. They didn't give me any program. Uh, I had to take my notes and reverse engineer it. And, and so, um, you know, having Mike Barris uh, by my side and, and, you know, mentoring me, you know, he helped me understand a lot of the science behind it. And, and um, I actually just had a conversation with Art Martori, the, the head of Sunkiss Kids at the U.S. Open. And he told me they were getting deeper and deeper into the science of, of training. But Personally, I don't think I need that science because I understand the the physiology of of training, and um, you know I could see a five year old kid. And I heard this from, uh, I think it's Chris Summers. Uh, he was a former men's uh, national team coach for gymnastics. He has a program called Gymnastics Bodies now. And he said that, you know, he's able to look at a five year old kid and see the next 20 years of training for him. And I don't think many coaches in the U.S. can do that, um, but I definitely am one of them. I could look at a five-year-old kid and say, physically, this is what he's going to have to be able to do because you can see body types at the earliest age and strength at the earliest age and um, whether it's the physical development, the technical development, and then um, the the mental development, which, you know, again, in the U.S., most people think mental development equals mental toughness, but really mental development is neurological transmissions, you know, between movements. And, and that is part technical and, and part right drilling right doing things over and over again um um to build those neural transmissions and so um you know with Dave you know I've been able to train him and put him through these training camps where um you know you start slow and you you end fast and and our volume never changes but by the end of camp which you know we just ended you know for the US Open here um his neurotransmitters are firing really really fast and his reactions are world class and you're never going to be able to build those reactions to be world class if if you don't understand the training and i guess it was kind of long-winded answer but you know that that's how i've been able to to do it in Michigan and and you know Mike again Mike Barris has, has been one of the guys that has shown me all the science and, and has backed what, what I've brought back from Russia to say, hey, you know, this is legit. It works. Let's bring this back to Ohio. Is it is it still kind of strange to be a St. Ed's guy, training a St. Aggies guy? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, you know, I, I love it. I mean, we, we never really thought Ignatius was a rival in wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> Fighting words there. It is. It is. You know, they beat us to one year uh, right after Howard Ferguson passed. But, uh, you know, I mean, just it, it's a big rival just school-wise, you know, academics, football, rugby, wrestling, every, basketball, everything. Um, but, you know, I think it's great. You know, D- Dave's just such a good kid. And, um, you know, I love training him. As far as the dynamic of the Cliff King Wrestling Club and how that has morphed into the, the training center that it is, what's it like now? You've got, you know, Slovenia represented, and then you've, you're not going to necessarily, uh, you know, spill the beans on what what other international plans you guys have in the works. But do you see the the concept of the training center morphing to more than just a, okay, just a base for the United States? Oh, absolutely! Like you know, I you know I I it's funny. I said I told this to Tim Foley the other day, but like. I wanted I, I at the time I really wanted to, to be the U.S. national team coach when when Zeke stepped down because like I mean they hired Bruce as an interim coach I, I I felt they could have hired me as an interim coach yeah I'm young I'm 
you know, I've, I've a little, you know, problem with, with, uh, you know, the authority. Right. But, but at the time I, I, I knew that I, I had the best plan and I could have had the best plan. Um, but I told Rich, I said, if you don't hire me now, I'm going to coach the world. And I didn't know what I meant at the time, but uh, you know, it's coming together that, you know, it doesn't matter who you compete for, you know, there's a lot of people out there that just want to compete at the highest level and, and doing it for another country. Um, you know, so we have a lot of international stuff in the works. Um, and really like not just in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but, uh, when Barris finishes his, uh, flagship, uh, facility in Fort Lauderdale, um, we're going to apply to get that as the North American, uh, training center for UWW, um, for all the, the, um, teams from, you know, yeah, all the, yeah, all the, not North American, but the Pan American, um, training center. So, uh, you know, they're looking for one and, and that's a good location. It's right outside of Miami. It's going to be a multi, million dollar facility. I want to say almost by $10 million facility for strength, conditioning, wrestling, ton of other sports. And, uh, so, so that's going to be our home away from home in, in Ann Arbor. And I don't think there's another club that could, you know, have that, you know, we even have, uh, you know, places to go in India and in Georgia, you know, Mike Barris has a, a facility in Tbilisi. And so, so if we need to do training camps over there, we have access to, to all of his stuff. And, uh, you know, it really is turning into, you know, an international training center. What's interesting is it now seems that with the advent of the RTCs, you've got athletes from other countries training, you know, uh, the Nittany Lion Wrestling Club, of course, with the Puerto Ricans, with with Franklin and, and Jaime that had trained there. And then, uh, you know, uh, Bebeto Yewa trained with the Minnesota Storm. So it's not a situation where it's like, oh, well, you're turning, you're, 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 you're training the other countries to beat us. No, it's, that seems to be more accepted now. Well, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I kind of hit on it earlier, you know, when I went and lived and trained in Vladikavkaz, you know, they have representatives from, you know, five, five different countries at this tournament that, that live and train in that city, that grew up in that city. Um, you know, it's a hodgepodge of nationalities or ethnicities, I should say, that, that, live there and so what you know whether you're armenian or ukrainian uh and you happen to live in that city um you know it's again it's just it's just training it's just you know letting somebody achieve their dream and not holding them back because of who they are or where they're from all right so as we said we don't know what the future holds tonight at least as we record this for david habit but uh, where do you see his career and his his trajectory going and as we look forward to this cycle in in 2020 is he got 2020 in his sights and beyond or is it just 2020 oh you know right now we just want to take it to 2020 but um you know i i, I think his tra- tra- trajectory is is really really high um you know he has an ability that even some of the best foreigners don't have um he can score a ton of points and and and, and i've mentioned it already his his reactions are world class um he just understands the sport um he studies it he, he trains it he lives it and uh you know i i think he he's not only going to be able to you know medal at europeans he's he's going to be fighting to to medal at the world championships and and uh you know i'm positive that you know he, he'll be a representative for, for his country uh at the next olympics and uh you know he has a lot of support within uww just because you know they don't get too many people who wrestle for a country that has historically never had a program and that just come on the scene and, and do what he was able to do and um you know th- they they like his style because he's exciting and, and and they like to promote that and uh i think it's good for them i think it's good for slovenia and and it's definitely good for our training center yeah, and, and with that, the first round matchup was Boris Novotkov, who wrestled at Cal Poly. Both were NCAA finalists. I mean, when you look at the draw, you get here, you fly all the way across. I was like, man, we could have driven and seen this. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it, it was fine. Jamil Kelly texted me late last night and was like, man, Boris draws a uh, American foreigner every tournament he, he comes in. Because I, I don't know who else he drew, but... Um, it, I can't remember who else was wrestling at the world championships in 15. Boris might have wrestled an American, um, but I can't remember. I'd have to look it up, but I know well, Yewa was there, for example, but he was at a different weight. But yeah, there was a couple at that weight. Yeah, but uh, no, I mean, it's exciting. Is it, how does that change your coach? You'd be like, okay, um, hmm, we know this guy. We really know this guy. 
What about Dave's uh, ability to, okay, this guy, I know this guy, uh, I'm going to, you know, get those low level attacks and realize he's, oh, crotch lift. I got to be careful here. I'm going to put my head out of the ankle. I'm going to prevent this throw. I mean, knowing a tactic so well internationally, you don't really get that feel that often. It's funny. It's funny you said that because that to me Boris was the worst draw that that Dave could have had um, coming in because you know I watched Dave at the at the New York Athletic Club tournament. I watched Dave at the Dave Schultz this year, and he, I mean he's wrestling for a medal at Europeans, which is arguably one of the toughest tournaments in the world. And he didn't even he lost he got pinned by Boris's brother at the Dave Schultz because he, you know he he's somebody that that lets certain mental things get in his head, and you know when he knows somebody he starts thinking about things instead of just reacting and um, you know before the match I was like Dave just wrestle I, I need you just to react and go 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 um, because when he starts thinking he slows down he makes mistakes and uh you know, so, so to me, that was really the hardest thing to get him to do. And, you know, he gave Boris, you know, the best match of the tournament so far and, uh, you know, wrestling really tough. And, you know, Boris is a winner and, uh, you know, he proved it again by making the finals. But, uh, you know, I, yeah, that was, that, was, that was hard. You know, he does so much better when he doesn't know who, who he's wrestling. <laughs> so we're talking with at Andy Rovat. Uh, any, any final thoughts before you get you got to fly out of here like. At the break of day, not even the break of day, even though the sun rises pretty early here, uh, you're going to drive across the Danube an hour down to, to Belgrade. But uh, just general thoughts on where where you're going the rest of the year. I mean, uh, what's what's the course of training for for Dave? And of course, there's not a qualification for the Olympics like there is. You've wrestled in the Europeans, you're going to the Worlds, Paris in August, right around my birthday. I'm going to be pretty psyched for that. But what about you? And and how's Dave's training going to be pushing towards the World Championships after this? Well, on a personal note, uh, I'd planned my bachelor party this weekend, <laughs> which at the time Time, the Europeans uh, were two weeks down the road, so I thought I would have a week off from the Open, go to Austin. Uh, so I leave from here, I get home uh, to Toronto, I drive back to Detroit, which is you know only a four-hour drive, um, get back to Detroit, uh, Ann Arbor, and uh, I leave the next morning at 8 o'clock, go to Austin for my bachelor party, um, got a whole bunch of former wrestlers from college and um well, Jake Herbert's coming, so it'll it'll be a fun fun weekend. But but once I come back, we, we you know we have a light week uh, with the, with the training. Then we have six weeks for the trials, uh, you know. So we have like a mini cycle, and and then our our another cycle uh, to prep um, for habit. Uh, we have uh, he's going to go to Ali Aliyev tournament in, in Dagestan in early July. Um, I won't be able to go with him because I'm getting married two weeks after the trials and. In July, I'll be on my honeymoon for two weeks in Spain. Um, so I'll be living it up, eating some good tapas, drinking some wine, hanging out on the beach. And, uh, but, but I'm, I'm shipping Dave off today. I talked to, uh, my coach, uh, from Russia. And so they're going to take care of him after he leaves Dagestan. He'll go to Ossetia, uh, live and train there for a month for his preparation for the world. He'll be able to come back home and then we'll do one last training camp before we go to, Paris in August. You know, there's a generation of fathers who are so relieved that you and Jake Herbert are both going to be off the market soon. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that, but um... <laughs> <laughs> just leave that one there. Andy Robat, thanks for Frank for joining the Short Time Wrestling Podcast, and uh, have a safe flight home and uh, good luck tonight. Oh, of course, by the time most of you listen to this, you'll know whether it's good luck or not. Yeah, thank you, Jason, and uh, it's great having you here. We're in Serbia, dude. What the heck? I know it's in Novi Sad. The food here, you order meat, you get a side of meat with your meat and more meat. This is not a safe place for vegans. No, no European place is safe for vegans. Or non-smokers, but we'll leave it at that. is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.